the perfect encounter. This day, this hour, and with each quickening step, you can feel the fear gaining on you as you hurry along that narrow and winding forest path. You want to turn, to see its face, to stare it down, to ask it why, why? But you don't, because there's no time. No time. The fear prods you up and over Mahaffey Ridge and down through the Valley of Shadows and Ferns and past the Beaver Pond and around the shallow lake. All along that path, furtive little rustling sounds remind you of its hiding places, dark and mean. And now, for the first time ever, the fear is even hounding you through the brooding marsh. It wants you to know that something is out there, something you cannot see. It wants you to feel its presence. Until last week, hiking this particular route had been such a soul-satisfying pleasure. What went wrong? What is happening? Everything in the forest seems on edge. It's your imagination you've told yourself over and over, but you can no longer deny it. You know now that certain parts of the forest have become forbidden to you, that someone is out there watching your every move. This afternoon, the fear ambushed you less than a mile from your secret camp. It dogged you all the way up to the ridge, down into the valley, past the lake, and now it's clinging to you like mud through the marsh. You feel like a scared little kid rushing to get home before dark. You sneak another look behind you while you fake tying a shoelace. Listen, listen. All through this lousy week, those same owls have hooted all along the trail as if you had somehow invaded their territory. Do owls normally hoot in the daylight? Even as you quicken your pace out of that marsh, an acrid stench of something fleshy and warm crinkles your nose. You pause to sniff the air and to listen harder. Nothing stirs, but the hair curls in your arms and up the nape of your neck anyway. Be smart, be safe, don't lead them home, you tell yourself. You deliberately pass by the hidden entrance to the faint game trail that leads up to your camp in the secluded meadow. Instead, you stamp your feet hard into the path so anyone listening in the forest behind you will know you are nearing the creek where it rounds the bend between two granite boulders. Once there, you slip off the trail to stand still as a shadow. Ten throbbing minutes go by, then twenty. You strain your eyes as the dusk closes its shutters to the paling light. Not even a leaf dares to fall. The owls stop hooting now, as if they're waiting for the darkness to come to hide them, too. While you listen for any telltale footsteps, you allow a small part of your mind to slip back to when it all began one short week ago. You had set out quite cheerfully from your campsite and had taken your usual hike up to Mahaffey Ridge. Cresting that ridge, you had followed a narrow and twisting deer path down through the tall ferns until you had dropped into your favorite valley. You had fully intended to stick to your routine as you had every afternoon since you had chosen this part of the wilderness as your research area. You would go halfway down the valley floor. You would swing left to skirt its quiet beaver pond. You would struggle up and over the steep saddleback on the far side. And finally, you would plunge down again to loop around the lake where wild ducks and geese raised their messy broods. From there, you would cut through the marsh before making that easy climb back up to the tiny meadow where your secret observation camp waits so cozy and safe among tall pines and huge hardwoods. It was a pleasant routine, that is, until last week. You had barely set foot on the floor of the valley when the fear had suddenly bitten into the back of your neck like a starving cougar. You'd spun around at least a dozen times as you had hurried along toward the ridge, your eyes darting this way and that. Oddly, you had not seen a single bird, none of the usual plentiful deer, and not even the old beaver that had lived alone in the pond and had smacked his tail at you in greeting. Instead, a feeling of some terrible menace had stalked you until you actually left the valley floor. Only then had that noxious feeling faded away to leave you sweating and trembling and cussing your way back to camp. All had ended well that night. By the time you were ready to crawl into your sleeping bag, you had laughed aloud at your own antics. After all, there was no one in that valley but you, right? Right? Come on, right? Wrong. 
The second day, the fear had slammed into you and the moment you had topped Mahaffey Ridge. Made stubborn by the total absence of anything tangible, you had jogged down through the ferns anyway and had crossed the valley that was again devoid of all wildlife. This time, the silent fear had escorted you all the way up to the saddleback as if it wanted to make certain you did not tarry along the way. The third day had been even worse. On the third day, the fear had lain in wait for you a full mile below Mahaffey Ridge and had kept a steady pace with you until you had quick trotted over the ridge, through the valley, and over the saddleback. But then it had stayed at your heels all the way past the lake and to the edge of the marsh. It was as if each day the fear took another giant step closer to your wilderness hideaway. It was as if something moving up along the creek snapped you back into the present. You don't move. You take in slow and deep breaths. You do not hold the breath. You let it flow again and again, slowly and slowly, so you can hear the click of a stone, the scrabbling of pebbles, the splash of incautious steps. You can't stop your big sigh of relief that follows in the wake of a fat raccoon that bustles past you whirring and cheering up a storm as if something has made it angry. The stillness of the forest folds in again as the insulted creature fusses off into the distance. After an hour more of calming silence, you melt into the trackless woods like an Indian. After all, whatever is back there might be human. They are the most dangerous stalkers of all. You cautiously make your way back up to your camp, toes touching the earth first, the tips of your boots nudging under the old leaves and brittle twigs one careful step at a time. You never put your weight down fully until you feel solid ground. You glide between knots of hungrily grazing deer without a rustle. You are proud of your prowess. Only last week, an old fox hunted the mice hiding beneath the dry brown grass in the meadow only yards from where you sat motionless and in plain view. Practice has made you perfect. It is pitch dark before you finally slip into your clearing and are greeted by... Interesting creatures, these owls. Their peculiar hoots don't match anything in your Audubon bird book. Sometimes they begin hooting like a great horned owl and end up moaning like an old barn owl. Oh, and remember that time early last spring when you were first pitching your camp and those same weird owls had hooted and moaned up a storm for three days and three nights running? They had not sounded too pleased about your arrival. But then one fine day everything became quiet and serene as if the owls had moved on for the summer. Now it's nearing autumn again. The air is chilling and everything in nature is steeling itself against the wants of winter. Maybe when those owls returned last week, they were surprised to find you still here. Your hands quiver ever so slightly as you scratch a match to your propane lantern. At the first flare of light, a coyote yaps somewhere off to your left. Was that a fox barking to your right? How odd. Since when do foxes and coyotes exchange information? No, no, your inner voice murmurs. Something could be imitating them. Remember... The Observer's Manual warned us that the forest giants are among the world's greatest imitators and intimidators. All that's happening was predicted. We've been expecting it. It's what we've worked for, so stay strong. Listen, listen, you shout to yourself as a cadence thumping rolls in from a far ridge. The distant thump, thump, thumping sounds like a giant babe roof smacking his bat against a tree. You quickly spin the knob of your lantern until its propane is choked to a trickle before you edge to its outer rim of dimming light. Perhaps the darkness will make you hear better. Crack! The sharp sound of wood striking wood somewhere in the forest behind you is immediately answered by a measured cue. Crack, 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 just to the left, closer still. You scramble back to choke the lantern into blackness. No matter how afraid you are of the unknown, you can't afford to have any late-night hikers stumbling in to destroy the privacy your research demands, not after all this time alone. The kid in you wants to curl into a ball and pull a sleeping bag over your head, but you manage to stand tall even though your heart is wildly slamming around inside your chest looking for a way out. Again, that long period of silence. In time, your heart puts its escape on hold, and your ever-forgiving mind begins to rationalize it all. Maybe a woodpecker had hammered into a hollow tree for one last snack before he tucked in. 
Even though Snappings and Cracklings was just some young buck deer getting an early start on the rutting season. The fear? Ah, oh, you've been coming out here every weekend for over a year with nothing like this happening, right? And now you've put your entire vacation into this last effort before the cold winds come and you can no longer greet the longest rays of the morning sun in the nude like the Indians of old. The fear is disappointment, that's all. Really? Let's go prove it. Curiosity killed the cat, you know. But you creep back down toward the main hiker's path anyway. It's easy to walk by starlight now. You've become used to it. Soon you're doing your own lurking, so near the main trail that you could reach out and touch anyone passing by. Another hour of silence grinds by. Silence? That's when you realize what else has been setting you on edge in between those weird noises. It's that glaring absence of the usual peeper tree frogs, the mournful cries of lonely loons, the whirring cicadas, and everything else that sings in the woods at night. To hell with it. Shaking yourself hard and without mercy, you return to camp to strike up the lantern until it hisses cheerfully before you set about your nightly work of preparing new slides for your microscope. Making slides is engrossing. The nights always slip by so quickly, and today had granted you a boon for your wildlife hair collection when you had discovered that bobcat den in the hollow below the old bat caves. You begin by setting everything up just like the Biology 101 manual you got from the library had explained. You carefully place on your folding table the cutting blades for hole mounts and sectioning, the alcohol swabs, the empty glass slides and cover slips, the various fixatives and stains, some Canadian balsam for mounting, and the hair samples. You reach automatically for your scissors, but they're not in their usual place on the stump beside your folding table. A quick search locates them lying in the grass beneath the rain fly to your tent. What? Impossible. All summer long, you've been so careful, so attentive to detail. A closer look around jumpstarts your heart to thumping again. Not a single item is towing the line you had carved into the stump. Every item has been moved. The soap, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, everything. Inventory time. You check off everything against your camp diagram. Nothing is missing, but things have definitely been moved. Suddenly, this night seems darker than most. Worse, the moon won't rise until it's nearly dawn. All you can do is sit back and wait. What was that? Did you really hear someone laughing from behind those thick brambles? Where, where? Right over there. That's ridiculous, the right side of your brain argues, while the left side shouts back, Pay attention, fool! Got thump! You whirl around as dead wood smacks against live wood to your left. Crack comes an answering wallop to your right. You don't dare to even blink as something huge and dry and strong begins to creak louder and louder until it snaps or the great top. Oh. The far end of your little meadow, a hollow tree keels over and slams into the earth with a sad shudder. Hey, no sweat, dude. It's coincidence. Some lazy brain sails from your idiot side offers with a dumb shrug. Yeah, the wind did it, so chill out. But the idiot side is proven painfully wrong as heavy footfalls begin to slowly circle your camp. As if drawn to the crunching sound by a magnet, you turn with each step. What to do? What to do? Your memory recalls the instructions of the manual. Try not to stare into the shadows, but your eyes do it anyway. Circle complete. The pacing barely halts before the air is compressed close to your left ear. Something round and hard zips past in sonic speed. You cannot move, you cannot breathe, you cannot cry for mercy. You can only listen to that hard rock bounding off to lose itself in the woods. Now you want to run, you want to scream, shout, yell, cry, beg, plead. You want to do anything except what you've been trained to do. But before you can unglue your feet from the ground, the woods around your camp is filled with the distinct and unmistakable sound of a baby crying. Oh, I've snapped, you muttered to yourself. I'm mad, insane, nuts, flipped out, gone. I'm over the edge for sure. Should I go to that baby's rescue? 
Maybe there really are some lost hikers. Maybe they saw my light. Maybe someone has collapsed out there and threw that rock just to get my attention. Maybe, maybe... Get a grip. You know exactly who is out there. Remember the rules. Remember what you've studied. Remember why you are here. You press your fingers together, just like the manual said. You automatically begin to count. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Another deep breath, in and out. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Both your breathing and your heart rate slows. Your blood pressure drops and you return to comparative calmness. Now you lift your arms out from your sides and you open your empty hands as you begin to pivot for one complete revolution of your own. As you turn, you somehow manage to say aloud, I hope you don't mind my being here. I hope you don't mind my waiting here all summer, but I'm determined to meet you. I want to know who you are, what you are, and why you are here. At that moment, the most incredible shrieking that ever chilled a human's bones fills the forest around you with a cacophony of sounds. It is terrifyingly loud, yes, but it includes, there you think it? It includes words strung together in between the cries of a crow and an eagle and the hoots of a dozen different owls mixed in with bird whistles and rabbit shrieks, coyote howls and fox barks. And those words, distinct in a language foreign to your ear, but words nevertheless. Somehow you manage to shout back. And perhaps then, then I'll know who, what and why I am. Come in where I can see you. I can't see in the dark the way you can. Please, come in and share with me. Look, I have no weapons. I have nothing in my hands at all. I really would like you to be my friend. In answer, no hard wood is bashed. No tree is shoved over. No one stomps about. No one laughs. And no baby cries. After a while, was it five minutes or fifty? You allow yourself to sink down to wait and to let your fears seep into the ground. It is the wee hours before moonrise when you are startled from a quick doze not by any sound but by a presence. Before you can focus your eyes you know something close to you has changed. You rub your weary eyes and peer into the blackness of the forest directly ahead of you there, a great and tangible mass is taking form. You don't utter a word when that mass takes one long step into the rim light of your lantern. The first thing you notice is this powerful dark being is opening its hands and is holding them out as if to show you those hands are empty of stones or clubs or anything bad. The second thing you notice are the glittering eyes that peer back at you from behind long tufts of unruly hair. Those eyes are wary, to be sure, but they are also intelligent and gentle and curious. This perfectly adapted being is wildly beautiful. And this is the moment you know that both of your lives have forever changed. agreement. Yate, welcome. How can you have your own perfect encounter? I won't tell you that it is easy, but I will tell you it is possible. I will also tell you that I can show you exactly how you can achieve it step by step. This journey is not for everyone. It is for those special people who wish to make a positive contribution to make our world a better place to live, not just for the human species, but for everything. As fellow adventurers, you and I must form an immutable bond between us. If I am to assume that you sincerely wish to stand face to face with that wondrous legend some call the Bigfoot or the Sasquatch, then you may assume that I know something of value 
that will assist you in achieving that goal. My sole request, in exchange for my sincerest counsel, you must promise with all your heart and all your honor that you will not initiate nor make any attempt to kill, capture, harass, or to interfere in any way with the lives and welfare of this gentle but wild humankind I prefer to call the giant forest people. A word of caution. To be successful, you must be true to your promise. If you are not, things might not turn out the way you wish. That said, I assure you that the moment you go on with listening to this recording, your perspectives on a whole gamut of things shall begin to change. Always shine the brightest and purest light into the deepest and darkest recesses of your own mind and your own soul. For only then will you begin to seek and to find truth. I'm Robert W. Morgan, and I welcome you to The Seekers. Step one, where to begin? In the library, of course. Take a fresh pad of paper and a fistful of pencils and trot straight down to your local library, or better yet, to the library of your community college or university. Everything begins there. Perform these tasks in their precise order. First thing, Create a chart of reports on your pad that has columns for the following. Report number, date and time, place and type of event, and your data source. List all incidents, now this is sightings and or tracks, that have occurred within an area that is not more than a 50 to 100 mile radius of your chosen home base. Why the range of 50 to 100 miles? Because the more hours you spend in the field, the better your chances are for a legitimate encounter. It would soon become tiring, not to mention expensive, if the distance between your home and your study area is greater than 100 miles. Don't be discouraged. Stay with me and keep listening. You may be amazed to find just how close those forest giants might be to you as you listen to this recording. Now, I have to give you a quick story. A grumpy old Viking friend of mine owns a farm that lies within sight of the city of Alliance, Ohio. He gave me a lot of ribbing when I began researching areas surrounding his homestead. Listen, he told me, I was born and raised in this house, and I know every clod of dirt for ten miles in every direction. Even if they exist, there aren't any Bigfoot around here. Have you tried Pennsylvania? After working with me in the field for a short time, probably to escape his cows, both my doubting friend and his charming daughter-in-law simultaneously saw a forest giant in broad daylight chasing a deer less than a quarter of a mile from his front door. Had they not been aware of this potential, my farmer friend might have ignored that hulking dark form that stood at the edge of the woods watching a frantic deer darting away, or they would have passed it off as an illusion brought about by sniffing fermented silo juice. My Viking friend is really ticked off now. In the two years that have passed since then, he has run into three close neighbors who had also seen big hairy people around that time, but they wouldn't admit it. The moral? Set aside every single preconception you have about where the forest giants might or might not be. Please allow me to guide you toward true giant habitat. The second thing, research to exhaustion all available books, magazines, old newspapers, and periodicals while asking librarians to obtain references from the county, state, or federal repository systems. Comb historical archives for mentions of monsters, or haunts, or bogeymen, or wild men. Above all, don't be shy about bugging local historians and folklorists for their advice. They are deep reservoirs of information, and you will probably find them unusually generous with their time and knowledge once they know you are serious. 
Hint, if you truly appreciate your professional librarian, they can open the doors to a wealth of knowledge. These professionals can find out everything about anything. Just make your requests polite and clear. Follow up on their suggestions and advice and show them the respect they deserve. Third, I want you to review local Indian legends to become familiar with whatever names that particular tribe gave to the forest giant people, such as wild men, brush people, stick Indians, or sneakers. Keep in mind that Native Americans spoke largely in symbolic terms so that those who should know will hear. Those who should not know will never understand. Here are a few example names to watch for. If you're out in the, out in the Southwest, Yamprico. Uh, among the Mi'kmaq people, it could be a Kukwis or Guguis. Uh, it could be Kiwakwi. How about Winsigo? up in Canada or in uh, uh, the state of Pennsylvania or New York. Wittigo is a Cree. Strendru is Wyandotte. And it goes on. Mohuni is among the Yukon people. Sasquatch, of course, in the British Columbia of Canada. Oma'a is a Hupa name. Zunaqua is the Kuakiudl. Iwashakachinate Seminole, or the Shawinachobi, seems to be in the Miccosukee peoples. So if you listen and watch for those, these will lead you in a long distance toward your goal. Now, don't be intimidated by any horror story you might read. Native Americans use frightening tales to keep their children close to the fire at night, just like you try to keep your kids inside. Remember, most tribes were in constant friction with neighboring tribes, and one of the greatest tests of Indian manhood was to kidnap young women to act as new wives in their tribe and to bring home as many able-bodied young slaves as possible. Oh yes, slavery among Native Americans in the good old days is far more common than you might suspect. However, the wisest people among the tribes knew that contact with forest giants should be respectful, and in some isolated cases, there was a symbolic relationship between tribal holy persons and the giants that included a type of spiritual trade. Emulating that attitude of respect will expedite your path to success. By the way, do not invade Indian reservations armed with a hundred questions. You might be as offended as they may find you offensive. Those elders among the Native Americans who know the ancient truths have good reason not to share sacred knowledge. These sovereign people have been brutally and sadistically treated for daring to worship our Creator in ways that Europeans did not approve. Their chosen ways of life were destroyed, and everything they freely shared with Europeans either has been exploited or slaughtered to the brinks of extinction. Be respectful. Leave them in peace. Now the fourth thing I want you to do. Contact your nearest map store for detailed topographical maps. Obtain one map large enough to cover all the areas that are convenient for you to visit. Attach it to a piece of cardboard and protect it with clear plastic that is thick enough to be written upon with an erasable grease pencil. Fasten it to a hook on a wall in the basement, in your bedroom, or behind a door. Keep it away from casual eyes. Hang your map only when you are actually working on it and put it away when you've completed each study session. The reasons for this prudence are manifold. Casual glances at your map can make you vulnerable to pranks that cost time, money, and dignity. Maintain top stealth secrecy in your study area, but always, always leave a written record of your exact destination in a clearly marked envelope at your house or your apartment with a second copy in the glove box of your car. Advise only your most trusted friends or your parents of this precaution in case of an emergency. I want you to be safe by being wise. Number five, learn to expertly read topographical maps. Invest in a good orienteering manual and the best compass and pedometer that you can afford. Get a medium to top grade Sunto or Silva compass or their equivalent that has a rotating ring to compensate for magnetic declination. 
Do not waste your time or your money on dime store pin-on baubles. You must know exactly where you are, and that takes precision equipment. And of course, now, if you can afford it, get a GPS system. Keep in mind that you also want to be proficient with your compass. And the reason is this. It doesn't need a battery. And if batteries go dead and you're depending on your GPS, you're in bad shape. Don't even think about taking a hike until you know how to use the tools of land navigation. Invest in your success by practicing compass orienteering and map reading. You'll soon use these new skills to make a special map that will log every move you make. Getting back to those new global positioning systems. GPS is great if you can afford it, number one. However, I remain firm in my advice that you acquire an old-fashioned skill using a handheld compass and familiarize yourself at least with the North Star. Why? Like I said, electronic gizmos depend on batteries that go dead without warning. Number six, mark each report location on the map's plastic cover with a small dot and attach the numerals one, two, three, etc., to correspond to the items listed on your chart of reports. Now append the master identification codes of S, T, ST, L, or O as indicated. S will mean a sighting. T is for tracks. S, T is for a sighting and tracks. L means its source was either early settlers or an Indian legend. O is for anything other than the above. Your coded legend might look something like this. 1 S for an actual sighting, 3 T for tracks, 5 S T for a sighting and a track, 6 L for Indian and early settler legends. Now take your time and do this thing correctly. You really must. Now, an example that will help you, I think, is I use different colors for the small X's to enhance analyses. For instance, I use a red X for sightings, green for tracks, and a red X circled by green for sight and tracks, blue for legends and early sightings, and yellow for other. You'll find that clusters of X's may begin to emerge on your first map. Remember, these clusters depend upon two factors, the presence of forest giants and the presence of human beings that saw them. Be cautious. Sightings appear in rashes and are often the result of the human condition I describe as me tooisms. However, at this point in your work, only one report per area needs to be accurate because we are only looking for pointers. Number seven, organize your entries into a single column and only by date and time of day. An enhanced pattern may soon emerge. An example, if three reports referred to a certain area during the months of October and November, and each incident involved night anglers, this could indicate a movement route used by night and in the fall of the year. This can be especially important if these reports span 20 to 30 years or more, especially if the most recent one occurred within the past three years. This could indicate it is an old and established route that may still be active. Number eight. Obtain a second set of topographical maps only for the areas that show the thickest clusters of incidents. These maps must be of the greatest magnified scale you can find. Now, using the most precise information at hand, even to the hour, minute, and second of the longitude and latitude of each report, transfer your legends from your first general working map to what are now your field maps. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this painstaking homework. If necessary, return to the library and obtain Xerox copies of each of these reports that appear within the clusters and any that appear to link them together. Study those reports until you know them by heart and recalculate your entries if you are looking for that pot of gold. Number nine, and this is the last thing. Prepare a site survey master checklist to assist you to determine the possibility or probability of an encounter. And make spare copies of this list for future use and attach them to a small clipboard. Now, here is a sample site survey that I'll use.
and I place a check mark beside each feature as it appears in this location. Be stingy now. Underestimate these things. Never, never promote yourself into believing anything that is less than a provable fact. Thus doing, you will save valuable time, money, and effort. Remember now, the conditions that I'm going to list are merely indicators. They are not absolutes. But here's the kind of things I look for. Number one, patches of dense willows, brush, or briar patches within one mile of the site. Number two, patches of dense hard or soft woods averaging 20 acres or more within a mile of the siting. Number three, stands of old timber exceeding 10 square miles and within 10 miles of the site. Number four, current or recent logging activity within 20 miles of the site. Number five, numerous gullies, washes, arroyos, or canyons within 10 miles of the site. Number six, a national or state forest within 20 miles of the site. Number seven, sparsely populated mountains or hills within 20 miles of the site. Now be patient. You must stay with these things. This will lead you somewhere, so stay with it. We're still going. Number eight, one or more rivers within 10 miles of the site. Number nine, one or more constantly flowing streams, creeks, or a swamp within one mile of the site. Number 10, sparsely located residences at half mile intervals near the site. 11, dairy, beef, truck, or grain farms averaging 200 acres or more within five miles of the site. Number 12, is there an Indian reservation located within 50 miles of the site? Number 13, stable deer, elk, caribou, antelope, or moose population. Number 14, predators in residence, such as coyote, fox, bear, lynx, wolverine, bobcat, and or panthers. Number 15, moderate to abundant fish, squirrel, rabbit, grouse, pheasant, and quail populations. Number 16, could you find places, I said, could you find places to hide from sight for two days or more? Number 17, could you hike the area without being seen between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m.? Number 18, if protected from hunters, could a black bear find enough to eat there? Number 19, have there been sightings within the past five years within two miles of this site? And number 20, have there been sightings 10 years or older within five miles of the site? Step number two, because you intend to become a wildlife photographer, dress like one. A well-laid-out vest is invaluable, if you remember which pocket has what. Taking a camera, your maps, all pertinent reports, and your site survey clipboard along, either drive, bicycle, or hike to those areas where the clusters appear the thickest on your maps. You see what we're doing? You see how we are eliminating the roaming around by predisposing ourselves. That's exactly what that research was for, and that's why you must be very meticulous about this. Now, when you enter the area, be as innocuous as possible as you perform your on-site survey. You see, before you were doing the off-site, you were eliminating all these miles of places. You're drawing yourself in. Okay, now... Now you're going to the on-site survey. If I'm asked, I state with all honesty that I am conducting a survey for some future wildlife photography, and I avoid telling anyone that my wildlife subject is some hairy, giant humanoid. I try to steer the conversation, as brief as I can make it, toward birds. However, if I'm recognized, which I often am, I never lie about it. I just can't go back to that area because it could become tainted with fraud and fakery and my time would be wasted. As you grade each site, imagine yourself in charge of a squad of six well-trained but unarmed U.S. Army Rangers whose sole objective is to secretly pass through this area while living off the land. Your squad of Rangers is extra special. Each person averages seven feet tall, each weighs 300 to 350 pounds. Their healthy bodies are impervious to the cold or to the heat. And they have had an enzyme injected into their stomach 
which permits them to digest the same raw food that a black bear thrives on. With this in mind, ask yourself how can your rangers silently hunt for meat when they get bored with veggies. Then assume that each of your rangers has been trained since childhood as a baseball pitcher who uses stones instead of baseballs. A seven foot tall, 350 pounds, you can imagine the effect of a creek bed stone hurled by these giants. A one or two pound rock rocketing through the air at 75 to 100 miles an hour will instantly kill or stun anything it hits. Now I'm gonna play devil's advocate. If sneak raids committed by your imaginary rangers are limited to one per year per farm or ranch, how can they go unnoticed? Well, it's easy. First, ask the ranchers if they ever lose a calf, a cow, a piglet, or a few chickens. Do they know or assume the blame always lies with predators, poachers, or rustlers? Then ask how much time they devote to searching for each carcass. Now ask exhausted farmers at harvest time if they ever bother to count the ears of corn that have been mysteriously stripped overnight. Ask them if they spare the time to check for human-like giant footprints in veggie patches when a row or two of carrots or potatoes have been rooted up, or do they bother to check their orchards for barefoot tracks when some apples are swiped. I'll wager that they take such losses as too inconsequential to bother with. With this in mind, make a second informed appraisal of the areas you have slated for site surveys. Remember, you are in charge of keeping your rangers alive and well hidden. Well, why are your rangers there in the first place? Do your rangers require something that is unique to that spot? Were your rangers forced by the terrain to cross that exact spot? Come on, what were your rangers doing there? If you can't find a logical answer at the site, be sure to ask these same questions of yourself when you refer back to your larger map when you return home. The answers might lie not specifically where the sighting took place, but in what rims that area. Study your topography and the ecology around the site, and if necessary, return to that site and do it all over again. Perhaps 20 to 50 miles to the north is a vast wilderness area or 10 miles to the south are neat little vegetable farms surrounded by brushy hills that provide a good covering for daytime snoozing. Alternatively, perhaps the sighting took place in a naturally occurring funnel that links one valley to another. Come on, think like a ranger commander. Above all, think for yourself. Have you noticed that I have not advised you to talk to the local farmers, hunters, or just plain residents specifically about Bigfoot sightings? Why? Because I don't want you to be interfered with. Now it's time to score each site survey. If any scores below five, proceed to the next site. If any site scores eight, your chances are approaching fair. However, when you find a site that scores 10 or better, it is time to proceed to step three. Step number three, selecting base camp sites. Before leaving to do any scouting in the bush, don't forget to deposit with someone reliable that sealed envelope containing exact information of your intended route and destination. Ask them to respect your privacy unless you do not return or telephone by a specific time. Remember to also place an identical envelope in the glove compartment of your car for any law enforcement or rescue group to find. Other than these two precautions, I suggest you keep your mission confidential. Upon arrival at the immediate area to be scouted, don't just jump into the woods. Take your time to cruise all the roads surrounding it, and I said all the roads surrounding it. Carefully check what you see against your map. Ensure that every house, barn, or other structure is marked. If there are omissions, new logging roads, county lanes, or homesteads, quickly update your maps. Take the time to accurately pencil them in. Now, what do you take 
for a single day's scouting sortie? Well, I would suggest your best friend compass, a topographical map of the area, which is obvious, a roll of yellow or orange plastic tapes, which you can get at a surveyor supply store, a waterproof marker pen, a rain slicker or a poncho, a flashlight with fresh batteries, spare batteries, and a spare bulb, a small canteen of water or Gatorade, especially on a hot day, a first-rate first aid kit complete with snake bite accessories, bug spray for ticks, fleas, and mosquitoes, a very loud whistle, a small roll of parachute cord, a sharp pocket knife, a set of dry socks and a pad of moleskin to cover blisters, a tin of aspirins plus any medications you might require, a few safety pins that can be easily pinned inside your pack or vest, and a light lunch that suits your taste and purpose. A small weather band radio with a fresh battery. Now these are options here, of course. Spare feminine napkins, if it's appropriate. Some sunscreen. Biodegradable liquid soap for encounters with poison ivy. A point and shoot camera and a spare roll of film. Now this is not for the Bigfoot. This is for if you find tracks or whatever. A filtration straw for additional water and waterproof matches. Now some optional items that make things easier. This basic day pack is intended for an eight hour scouting sorties, but you can add binoculars, a sweatband, and anything else that'll make you happy. Another optional item that could be invaluable is a walkie-talkie that has the emergency channel number nine. If you can possibly afford it, do invest in this super backup. However, these things eat batteries. I suggest using rechargeable batteries. The long range cost will be less and you will always be assured of fresh power. Now, what not to take. Do not take a rifle, a shotgun, a pistol or weapons of any kind. If you fear snakes, take a hiking stick. If you see a snake, either walk around it or gently move it from your path. Don't kill anything. You must always protect the image of a non-aggressive entity that has come to observe and to communicate, not to dominate. Before you enter the woods, you must determine, can your car be safely parked within one mile of your planned entry point? If your car can only be parked safely within two or three miles, will a bicycle suffice to get to the point of entry? Near the point of entry, is there a place where the shuttle bicycle can be safely hidden? Now, after you enter the woods, you must discover a campsite that is secure from accidental discovery by hikers and is at least 200 feet from any natural water source. Public campsites must be at least one mile away, preferably five miles or more. Now, another question, can a small fire be safely and legitimately built? Some advice, large fires reflecting off trees are dead giveaways to your wilderness camp. I prefer the safety of low light propane lanterns and stoves. Another question, is sufficient water close by in case of a fire? Or is water close enough to be hauled in and staged in a fire standby bucket? We've seen what happens with forest fires accidentally set. We must be very, very, very careful with fire. Now, are you secure from poison ivy and poison oak around your campsite? Are there rock overhangs nearby that could shelter you in an electric storm? And are there dry caves, crevices, or a protective overhang nearby where you could safely cache your camping gear for a week or two in waterproof bags? You do not want to haul it in and out every week. Now, warning. Here's a warning here. If there are bats in the cave, don't disturb them. They are valuable to the ecology. They eat a whole lot of those mosquitoes you hate. And don't stir up the guano. The airborne dust can carry debilitating and even deadly diseases. If you elect to store your gear there, carefully protect it from the guano, both old and new. Lacking caves or outcroppings, are there trees 100 yards or more away where you can conveniently hang your food bag out of the reach of bears or raccoons? Another question, are there numerous ground squirrels or rodents in the area? Remember, 
They can carry serious diseases such as bubonic plague. Plus, they attract snakes. If you elect to camp there anyway, don't get angry at the rodents or the snakes. It's your choice. Now the question, can you exit your camp with ease in the dark in case of a medical emergency? Do you see trees close by that have been struck by lightning? If so, choose another spot to camp. Do not camp along ridges. Lightning could use you as the rod. And I want you to trade your metal rods of your tent for those made of wood or fiberglass. Could forest giants secretly observe your camp from one or more sides? Because that's what you want. Also, could forest giants secretly visit your camp in your absence? Yes, that's even better. Remember, this is what you want. You want to make yourself vulnerable but safe. Last, can you make this a minimum impact camp? Can you camp at least 200 feet away from natural water sources? Now, you may wish to move your camp from time to time once you're familiar with the area, so don't put down deep roots. Remember, once your camp is established, I want to teach you how to attract them to your camp. Step four, the art of research security. I hope you agree with the premise that in the best of all worlds, one is constantly encouraged to test the limits of one's physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual capacities. Therefore, I believe that genuine friends with pure hearts always support the sincere efforts of those whom they call friend, even if those efforts are contrary to their personal beliefs. In my humble opinion, that is what friendship means and what loving demands. After all, the shame is not in falling short of one's goals, for there are no true failures among those who try. The shame falls only upon those who do not try. However, human nature being what it is, the moment you undertake research in this or any other genre that transcends the mundane, you will find yourself the butt of jokes from the ignorant, the target of pranks from the envious, or the subject of fakery from the fools. Why? Because you dare to rise above the norm. You dare to ask the why of a mystery, and you dare to attempt finding an answer. By taking up these dares, you automatically hold up a great mirror to those who pretend to be content with the status quo, and they may hate their own reflected image and blame you most for holding up the mirror. Be wise. Secure your personal research area to avoid the ignorant, the envious, and the foolish. Don't advertise, discuss, or boast about anything that you're doing or where or how you're doing it. If you are criticized for not sharing your goals and your methods with those who consider themselves your peers, ask those same critics if they have paid for your midnight oil your maps, your equipment, your fuel to search out the area, your sore muscles, and your elevated blood pressure from the tension. If they have not, you owe them nothing. Personally, I choose to avoid most clubs of Bigfoot researchers, although I am sure there are isolated groups of sincere individuals who benefit from the camaraderie of such activities. Of course, there are such persons as George Haas, Jim McLaren, and Lauren Coleman, and a few more who have true integrity. I find such persons rare. Unfortunately, I found most clubs are organized and led by petty megalomaniacs, some smart and even charismatic with foreign accents and silk scarves and tales of killing adventures in the Orient or Asia, but many more are as dumb as a box of rocks. Either type of so-called leader tends to drain the strength and pocketbooks of the strong, envy the efforts of the active, and have been known to actually sabotage the successes of the brave. An example, one individual has a penchant for writing poison pen letters to the news media against those who do not follow his lead. When questioned as to his motive for, quote, researching Bigfoot, end quote, he openly boasts that he intends to track down and kill a Bigfoot so that he can use his new fame to form a rock band. 
That's disgusting. My particular approach to forest giant research is best executed either alone or with the fewest associates possible. While I have professionally fielded teams as high as 13 highly qualified researchers at great cost and for months on end, I have also worked with more success using compact teams. My best results came from either working alone or with one or two special persons who are completely in tune with them and with the heartbeat of nature. In those times, I can wholly concentrate on every bent branch or torn leaf, every owl hoot, and every stick that falls or limb that breaks, and every notion that waves over me. Alone, I am vulnerable, and that vulnerability makes me highly aware, and that's precisely the state you need to attend. The best method to cover your tracks is to purchase an old but reliable bicycle without paint or charm, yet sturdy and functional. Quietly ferry the bicycle to your selected research area. Hidden from prying eyes and near the entry to your selected area, stash in the thickest brush all your long-term base equipment, such as your tent, your ground cloth, lantern, fuel, portable stove, pillows, sleeping bag, rain cover, extra warm clothing, bug sprays, soap, whatever else you're going to use. Be sure to select a spot that is secure from casual hikers, yet close to where you wish to enter the bush. Next, drive your car to a secure parking area. If you admit to a local farmer or a gas station or bait shop owner that you are an amateur wildlife photographer looking for some unusual shots, some nice person might allow you to park where your car will be safe. That accomplished, use your bicycle to return to your equipment stash. Believe me, it is easier to pedal up and down hills without anything on your back, and you don't attract much attention. Now it's the bicycle's turn to be stashed while you use your backpack to shuttle everything to your selected site. It may take a few hours, but that's fine. Unbelievably, this is exactly the type of activity that will arouse the curiosity of a forest giant. That is, if they have a 